What's up, guys? This is Zadi again, Gate 7 International. A really fun deep dive ahead of us on a really fun, interesting player. But before we go and we get started with some of the analytics, the player profile, don't forget to like and subscribe. Help us continue to grow the red and white community. Every engagement boosts us up the algorithm. It helps us find more and more red, white fans. More of you guys find us every day, and we hope to find even more of you. And don't forget to check us out on Patreon. You can get early access to these deep dives. Some of the deep dives have been around for about a week before the player gets announced. If you want early access to that, if you want extra access to the detailed analytics of post-match and special interviews we do outside the scope of Libyakos, check out our Patreon, support us there, and you can get access to all of those things. Now, without further ado, everybody, let's get to it. We're talking about the man of the hour, Gustavo Scarpa. 29-year-old attacking mid, winger, wide mid. He's also played fullback that is currently on loan now at Olympiacos from Nottingham Forest where he signed his pre-contract and he joined for free after finishing his contract with Palmeiras. He's 5'10", 177 centimeters tall, 77 kilograms or 169 pounds. And until he was purchased by Nottingham, he spent his whole career in Brazil. His professional career, he was with Fluminense, where he spent a year on loan with Red Bull's team in Brazil. And after he finished with Fluminense, he spent a few seasons at Palmeiras, five seasons to be exact, where he won two Copa Libertadores, uh, both of them under previous Balk manager Abel Ferreira. He was heavily rumored, if you guys remember, to come to Olympiacos last summer. Every insider in Greece was saying he was coming, but everyone in Brazil kept saying he was going to Forest. In the end, he went to Forest, but regardless of what the arrangement was, he is now back in Piria anyway. So he's a very slick, tricky ball carrier, incredible vision, and a pretty high IQ player. You guys might have seen the video of him doing the, the Rubik's Cube. That isn't just a trick. The, the guy the guy's pretty smart. He's also a set piece master as well. So we'll have another one of these guys that we can add uh, to our repertoire or our portfolio of set piece takers on the team. Now, Scarpa's arrival represents a very interesting proposition. And surely it has to mean that there's going to be some movement amongst our plethora of tens or attacking mids that are right now coexisting on the roster. But we're going to get into that later. Let's get started, as we always do, with the profile, with the data, starting with goal creation. Now, if we're taking a look at the data, we there isn't really enough for us to pull from his time at Nottingham Forest. He barely paid fi played 500 minutes. That is not a good sample size for us to really assess a player. So what I did was I went back in the 2022 season in Brazil, and I took his data while he was still playing in Brazil, his last season at Palmeiras. And as we look at it, we see some very interesting things. Now, goal threat, he looks decent on goals. He's sitting close to that 60th percentile in Brazil. You see his XG is way up there. But most of his goals that he had, at least in this season, came from penalties. He was the penalty taker for, for Palmeiras, so that accounts for a lot of that high XG. But he also did have plenty of not just opportunities, but goals and run a play. Situations were all over the place. Uh, not a lot of patterns, too, outside of the fact that he got some of these opportunities from running into space constantly, receiving the ball. He was con consistently positioned in the middle of the field, but he is a threat almost anywhere from within that 20 meter mark 20 meters or less. He can whip a shot in decent curl on the ball with power seemed to have more than a few deflections that worked his way. So uh, we'll see how sustainable some of these results are. He's not very selfish though. In the penalty area, he's as likely to pass the ball as he is to shoot. And you can see here, I mean, his, his assist creation assist volume is higher than his, his goal creation. Very high volume, of course, from set pieces. I saw a lot of assists from free kicks, corners, didn't matter. And he's got pretty good accuracy on those. But his vision in open play and his ability to cut a defensive 
line open is just stellar. Some lovely through balls to connect with his wingers that are running in stride or even the forward, doesn't matter. He can dribble past the defender to create space, make an opportunity for his teammates. So many situations, different situations where he found success, whether it was on a counter or open play buildup, the, the gameplay IQ, what he saw unfolding just didn't cease to amaze me in Brazil. Even in England, where he didn't have as many opportunities, he still looked pretty good. You could still see elements of that, just a few touches on the ball, and he, he could make some interesting and fun things happen. And it spoke volumes to me when the loan was announced and Nottingham Forest fans got upset. Not like Garvalho when we got him or Thiago Silva, where they said, oh, we had some flair, but you know he was inconsistent. They're actually annoyed that Gustavo Scarpa left because they saw a very talented player. And I think they believe that maybe they could have gotten more out of him. So looks solid in England, even though he didn't play that much. Um, I will say that with Gosas Fortuny still in the lineup, I don't believe he's going to Saudi Arabia. I don't believe that he's leaving. And if he stays in the team, I'm not sure how many of these set pieces Scarpa will be taking as long as Costa's on the field. But that's something that we can monitor going forward and we can see what happens and how that unfolds. Up next, we have passing and build up. Now, in build up, Scarpa represents a very interesting prospect. He can be an engine in possession and he can travel, he can be a central point of distribution, carries the ball forward very well. No problem doing it, but even though his volume looked relatively average, if there is space, he'll take it. Uh, quick one-touch balls, primarily in the middle of the park, can go out wide if needed, can be involved in buildup when he's out wide as well, but he does seem slightly less effective when his back is to the touchline. When he's in the middle of the park, the possibilities seem endless. It doesn't seem like you can dispossess the ball sometimes because all he needs is a little bit of space to make something happen when he had that back up against the touchline and he only had a couple of chances. Sometimes we saw that maybe he wasn't able to make the dribbles around some of the opposing defenders. Just another indicator that he's a little bit better as long as he stays in the middle of the park. Pass accuracy, it may seem abysmal here. You're going to look at it's going to be close to that 30th percentile in the top area right there. But he does take a lot of risky passes, a lot of long downfield balls that don't always have the highest percentage chance of success. I, I don't want you guys to think when I say he takes some of these risky chances or high, you know, low percentage balls, he's not a risk for his own team. They're just difficult passes. If he stuck to these five to eight meter passes, we see a lot of these center mids do, you know, his pass accuracy would be 99%. He's never misplacing those, but he, he takes a lot. Uh, he makes a lot of great looks and difficult passes. They don't always work, but that's a reason why you're going to see him have this lower pass accuracy. Uh, always looking for those big plays. And sometimes that's what you get, you, but you have to have somebody that can see those big plays happening. We've talked about this before with Madi. Madi's got great vision. Sometimes the execution's not there. It's hard to teach vision. It's hard to teach that aspect of the game. Sometimes you either got it or you don't. So bringing it back, he's always looking for his teammates running into space. I never saw too many instances against a parked bus with him. This is something to keep in mind. His best moments that I watched in Brazil were when the game was open. So when the game's locked down tight against a parked bus, we don't have a very large sample to go on and see how he'll react. He can play physically, he can dribble past defenders, and he can pass a move. He has no problem running to help draw defenders away. I, he should be effective, even against the park bus. We just don't have a very large sample size to really determine whether that's the case or not. Now, moving on to his defensive traits, I've mentioned so many times when it comes to these offensive players, and I'll mention it again with, with Scarpa as a, an attacking mid-winger. We don't really care how great of a ball winner he is on the defense, but what we do care about is, can he press? Can he track back? On the pressing aspect, didn't seem super coordinated with the team. If the ball was near him, he runs to it or close the lane down. If a teammate's running, doesn't seem to track back much at either, at least when he was in Brazil. There were matches in, in Libertadores where 
I saw he was more involved defensively. So it leads me to believe that he will follow instruction if necessary. I do have some concerns in Europe about him leaving the midfield exposed or maybe even against a team like Ike. His positioning isn't amazing. And we saw what Ike's diamond did to us when our midfield was not in sync or compact. Not great in the air. Probably not going to win a lot of those aerial duels or aerial uh, 50-50 balls, at least when he's with us. His best work is going to be on the ground. I do want to stress again, he seems to work well in instruction. If the Libertadores matches were any any indicator, Palmeiras played a little bit defensive, a line that stayed a little bit deep, and he did follow instruction. So... As long as he can follow instruction, he'll fit probably in the Diego Martinez system. I'm just pointing out what I saw, and it was the fact that I didn't see him position himself very well in most of those matches, especially in Brazil. Up next, we've got your favorite. We've got some comparisons here, boys and girls, and this time we have a cheeky comparison to Cosas Fortunis. I figured, since we're bringing another attacking mid, especially one that's as talented or reportedly to be as talented as Scarpa. I felt it appropriate to compare him to the best attacking mid we have on the roster. We've all seen Costa's data last season. I've showed it to you guys time and time again. And when we look at the differences between Scarpa and Costa, it's it's pretty astonishing, actually. Both players are difference, mag- are difference makers. Their swagger, though, is completely different. Swagger isn't something we measure. In the data, obviously. It's just something you see when you're watching the tape. Costa is a more dangerous end product, despite also being a set piece master. He's more likely to carry the ball forward in open play and get on the end of a pass in the box. Versus Scarpa is more likely to be the one playing the ball into the box. Costa's a little bit more straightforward with the ball at his feet on the dribble, keeps it close. Maybe a turn of direction, you know, left or right. But that's how he is. Scarpa has just about every trick in the book to get by a defender. Stepper, step overs, Cruyff. He has a lot of things he'll throw at it, whereas Costa probably isn't going to try a lot of those things. Both of these players are very effective and can create quality chances for their teammates while also maintaining their own goal threat. Looking at the webs, you don't see much difference in a lot of scenarios. I mean, you, you do see some... Uh, you know, looking looking down at the web in that bottom right, you see Scarpa, higher volume of passes to the penalty area, more smart passes, more key passes, higher overall expected goal contribution. But again, that's going to be related to the penalties. Costa doesn't take penalties. If we go from non-penalty, it's a lot closer. But then we look at Costa and we see Costa's in more touches in the box, carries the ball forward more, progresses the ball a little bit more. Um, into the final third, that is, not overall. Uh, Costa is at the center of possession a little bit more, but maybe that changes when Scarpa gets into Greece. So the difference here is Costa's build-up metrics are a little bit better, while Scarpa's, um, his, the balls that he plays, his service into the penalty area seem to be on a little bit higher scale. So looking at looking at the comparison between Costa and Scarpa, looking at the data, what is the verdict? How do I feel about this player? And look, overall, you guys know, I've already told you kind of the different parts of his play, what concerns me, what doesn't. I'm still giving this one a two thumbs up. It's only a loan. I'm not 100% sure how he'll transition to the park buses and Greaves. Uh, you know, 13 out of the 14 teams we play are just going to sit back. But I believe that against those teams, he has the quality to produce. So much of what I saw happened in open play with with spaces and not when other teams had 10 to 11 players behind the ball. But the guy is an X factor. You can see it. Just like I told you guys with Imbam Huang when he came in, like you see it when this guy plays. He's got something. It's a loan. Low risk financially, but it could be a very important move to stabilize the season for us. Now, as I brought up briefly before, we need to address this now. His arrival surely signals the exit of, at the very least, the likes of Joao Carvalho, maybe even Pep Biel as well. 
There were rumors of uh, Cosas Fortuny's exit. I brought that up earlier to Saudi Arabia. It looks like he's going to be signing a renewal with the club, but we'll monitor that as that continues. This is just how the state of it is at the time of recording. Now, while the player does excite me, I do worry we're going to have similar issues that we do with Cosas Fortuny's, Biel, and Carvalho. The best moments of Scarpa were when he played central, not out wide. Similar problem we have with Fortunis and Biel and Carvalho. We need real wingers, and we need to get rid of one or two of these 10s. Carvalho and Biel, at this point with Scarpa coming in, can go. Whether it's alone or they, they can go because neither one has impressed in these qualifiers so far. Carvalho was a king in preseason. Looked fantastic. But now the real deal is here, and he can't produce. He's invisible when he's on the field. Pep Biel, we, when does the experiment end? When do we throw in the towel? If we're not going to play him at the 10, what are we doing? He doesn't offer us on anything on the wing. And then in our qualifier, the, the second round match we played against Genk, two great opportunities in front of goal that he just whiffed. Like it or not, at least one of them has to go. And if you're going to have three tens with Scarpa, Fortunis, and Pepio, you need to decide. Is there room on the roster for them? I don't think there is. If it were me, I keep Scarpa and Fortunis. I send Biel on loan if I can't sell him for what we paid for. Him. That's how I'm looking at it. All in all, guys, the signing is this loan is, is a great move to bring us another aspect, another dimension to our attack. Our attack. Gordon is doing business. Let him cook. He's continuing to make the team and build something for the future. And he's building and bringing these reinforcements without the promise of Europa League football. Huge stuff. Keep it going. Let him cook. Gordon, keep doing your thing. Thank you guys again for tuning in to yet another deep dive. I hope you found this informative. And I hope you were able to obtain more insight on the player that maybe you didn't have before. More signings are coming. More scouting reports are going to follow. And I'll be the one that's sitting there doing the analysis for you. Gate 7 International will be here giving you the latest news that we can, as much as we can about these players, best analysis, whatever we can do for you to keep you guys abreast of what's going on at the, our favorite club. So thank you, everyone, for listening. This is Gate 7 International by the fans for the fans.